And I come to the point number 10, which is what are the, or question number 10, what are the core responsibilities of the spouses and are they different for the man and the woman? Now, this is something which in Islam, it's very, very clear. Uh, Islam operates on the, on the principle of equity, not equality. Um, when it comes to gender uh, relationships, and, and responsibilities because equality is unequal. Equality actually is unfair. Uh, equality means everybody gets the same responsibility. Everyone gets to carry the same weight, whether a person is an ant or an elephant. Now, that weight might crush the ant completely and destroy it, whereas, whereas the elephant will not even feel the weight. Islam does not believe in this. Islam believes in responsibilities in accordance with the strengths of the person and with understanding of their weaknesses. Uh, what a person can do best is what they are, is what is given to them as the core responsibility for themselves. So in Islam, the man has the core responsibility of being the wage earner and the provider for his family. And the, the definition of family is, um, is not the same as in a Western thinking concept. In Islam, the family is the man, his wife, his children, and uh, it also includes the parents of the man, and it also includes, uh, if need be, uh, his siblings, uh, if they are in any need and so on, all this is responsible is the responsibility of the man. For the woman, her responsibility is her husband and her, and her children and her parents. Um, and responsibility in the sense, for, let me come back, let me reword that. For the man, the responsibility is in terms of providing sustenance, maintenance, money, whatever they need. Uh, for the woman, the responsibility is in raising good children and in maintaining the home and in, <clears throat> and in guarding um, and, and being responsible for the property <coughs> of, of her husband and of course, obviously, it, uh, of herself. So it is, uh, responsibility is divided. It's, uh, she, the woman does not have to go out there and earn money. That's not her responsibility. Whereas for the man, this is his responsibility. We, I'm, I'm not deliberately going into the differences of uh, the rights of men and women. We'll do that separately. Uh, and you, some of you might be very surprised to know what the rights of women are in Islam. But for the moment, the core responsibility of the man is to work and earn a living and take care of the financial um, responsibilities and the financial uh, needs of the family. Uh, the core responsibility of the woman is to make the home a place of beauty and grace and harmony and to focus on the raising of children. Uh, Imam Abu Hanifa even went to the extent of saying that a man is not only uh, required to provide food for the house, but he is required to provide a cooked hot meal for his wife and children. Now, how he, how he does that, whether he cooks it himself or whether he, uh, you know, gets it from somewhere else, that's, uh, that's his responsibility. So the, this whole concept, especially in our South Asian cultures of uh, the woman being relegated to the kitchen, this is not from Islam. This is South Asian. Uh, the woman is being created for making samosas and, and chapatis and parathas. No, uh, this is not from Islam. This is South Asian in nature. This came from our non-Islamic South Asian cultures. Um, this may sound a bit old-fashioned to you, but if you look at the uh, 
result of the of our uh, what are called yuppie puppy cultures uh, you might be uh, you know you might come around to this way of thinking uh, of giving responsibility and of making what is really important important um, leaving uh, your children to be raised by your devices you know by your ipads and iphones uh, is a very very bad idea it's an extremely bad idea the children must be what must be inculcated in the children is um, is the ethics and the values and the morals uh, of 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 islam of is, of good islamic people and believe me there's no difference i mean there's the same ethics values morals we talk about are good for everybody uh, if they would like to inculcate that in their children and that won't happen unless you believe in those values yourself so the, everything begins from there now responsibility naturally also when we say core responsibility i said core responsibility of the man is outside the house uh, core responsibility of the woman is inside the house meaning for the raising of children obviously there is a sharing of responsibility the man is uh, most uh, is is uh, required to is this is recommended for him that he also participates because he is the father so he also participates in the raising of the children uh, and of course all uh, you know work around the house and so on and so forth uh, just popping your feet up on a uh, on on a chair before the television with uh, eating popcorn or samosa or whatever this is not uh, this is not what is recommended in in islam um so wash the car water the garden mow the lawn yeah take out the garbage uh, all of this is part of uh, the responsibility of the man similarly once the mom has taken care of her core responsibility then it's good if she also waters the garden uh, washes the car mows the lawn takes out the garbage and doesn't sit in the in front of the tv uh, with her feet propped up and a bowl of popcorn at her elbow Now, women generally don't do that that kind of stuff. So I'm just saying this more as a joke, but men do, so they should really think about it uh, seriously. Now, all the stuff that I have said is not may not apply in every culture. Um, so you know, but whatever passes for it uh, in your culture. So the core responsibility, and of course, the peripheral responsibilities which we need to do in order to live a um, a good life the important thing in all of this is to remember that in a marriage the primary purpose is the raising of children and the raising of children is not simply to feed them and give them a dry bed you do that for your puppy and your cat not for your child children children need a lot more than food and clothing and shelter uh, if you want to develop a human being who will be your legacy to the world a means of sadqah jariya for you for you if that is what you want to do then you have to do a lot more than just feeding them now i i seriously believe that effectively as parents you need to dedicate yourself to that because it is that important the problem is that most uh, i don't say all but definitely the vast majority of parents uh, become parents uh, almost by accident uh, they when it hits them they re- suddenly realize that you know what did i what did i get uh, i didn't bargain for this well you may not have bargained for it but you got it and that's the reason why it's very important to uh, have your wi- eyes wide open and decide that you want children and be clear in your mind about what that means in terms of um, of your responsibility a child is not a toy it's not a little doll uh, it grows up it has uh, issues it has problems it has strengths it has weaknesses and uh, you are to a great extent the architect of all of that and you are to a great extent the architect of the future of the child and uh, um, sooner and quicker uh, you realize that i think the happier Uh, everyone all all around will be um 
On, on another uh, tack, I've met a lot of parents who struggled very hard, and I'm talking about struggling as in uh, for their financial well-being. They struggled very hard in the early stages of their lives, and who say to, as to, who say to themselves and to everyone else with great feeling and with tears in their eyes, I will never allow my children to have that kind of a struggle. Uh, I will never allow my children to face the kind of hardship that I had to face. So when I hear this statement, I uh, say to them, please change the wording of this thing. Yeah? When you say it next time, uh, say, I will never allow my children to have the power that I have to succeed. So suddenly they get a, you know, they, they suddenly become, they, they, they have a shock. And they say, no, no, I'm not saying that. I say, exactly that's what you're saying. You're saying that you want to take away from your children the strength that you have by which you succeeded. But you do not want your child to have that strength. He said, how do you think you build that strength? You build that strength by facing hardship. You build that, uh, you build that strength by going through hardship, by facing the challenge, by getting up, by rising every time you fell in your life. And you're saying, I'm going to make sure that my child uh, never falls, that my child is, uh, never runs, uh, my, my child never uh, has to face any difficulty. Well, uh, one very definite outcome of that is that your child will be uh, handicapped in the most important ways, which is that he or she will not have the strength to face hardship because they would never have faced it. But you will not be able to protect them from hardship. Think about this. You can protect them while they are in your control, perhaps. But in life, you will not be able to protect them. And when the first hardship hits them, it will probably knock them out because they will have, they will have, they would have had no experience of facing hardship and of coming out of it uh, confidently. And when it hits them, it's gone. Right. So think about this. Um, so if you, um, many people don't don't see it like this and I think it's it's time you did. If you protect your child and you don't allow him to enter the fray of life and compete, uh, to get their nose bloody uh, in the struggle, to cry with frustration in the night and to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and beg him for his help um, and then learn to dry the tears and work out new alternatives. If you allow him or her to come running to you and lend him your shoulder and box of tissues uh, for their tears, then remember you are the worst enemy of the child. You father, you mother are the worst enemy of the child. You are programming them for failure. You are willing to, you are writing the script to destroy their life and to make a parasite out of them who will never have the respect of the world and will forever live in a state of mediocrity, laboring under a battered sense of self-worth, which in many cases comes out in the form of aggression and overpowering control on the spouse who is the only one on whom uh, he can vent his uh, spleen. Now, I have, very sad to say that I have seen this in, um, in, in at least two cases uh, in my life with uh, parents who were themselves amazing people. They, they, they were so, um, I mean, they were, they were good in every way, right? And they had, they were at the peak of their positions, they had struggled, they had succeeded, um, they became mentors for so many people, but their own children came out completely worthless because of this having to live under the shade of this father uh, or this mother uh, who refused to let them fend for themselves, refused to let them take any risk because they were so overprotective of them. And the same thing translates, goes into the marriages where you have these, uh, in this case, forgive me for saying that, but in my experience, I've never seen a father doing that. I've seen the mother doing it all the time, which is the mother becomes this, uh, this within quotes, great confidant of her daughter and uh, has these night long conversations uh, with the daughter, with the daughter moaning uh, and groaning about her marriage and the mother giving her, uh, you know, giving her giving her ideas and solutions, so so to speak, uh, blow, asking for blow by blow accounts of uh, the the boxing match that, that they have con converted their marriage into, and then suggesting would say this to him and do this to him. You know, that destroys a marriage faster than anything that I uh, that I can imagine. Right? That's the fastest destroyer of marriage. So please do not under, do not do not do this to your own children. 
Um, struggle builds strength. So let them struggle. Opposition teaches how to fight in the struggle of life. Difficulty teaches how to win. Uh, if there was no Goliath, David would have remained a shepherd boy. Eh? Salam became the king and became, of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the vote. But he came to province because of the uh, of the one step that he took forward uh, when Talut called him. He was called for a volunteer to fight against uh, Jalut, against Goliath. Uh, Salam, David stepped forward. If that one step, if he hadn't taken, then he would not have seen what he had seen. And that's why it's very important. Many parents don't understand this and they are the architects of their children's destruction, tragically with the best of intentions. Now don't do that to your, don't, do not do that to your children, do not do that to your marriage. Many parents equate expense with quality and they give their children the most expensive education which insulates them from the realities of life and so they never learn to fight the real battles. Um, they think that giving their children all the latest toys, latest gadgets, uh, taking them on expensive holidays, uh, that this is what constitutes uh, life. Believe me, this does, this does not constitute life. This is, this is uh, completely and totally uh, destructive. So do not do that uh, to, your, to, your, to your child. Um, the, the, pro the problem with giving uh, expensive toys uh, is really to give them a, a standard where they learn to define human value in terms of material worth. Yeah. The best kids are those who have the best toys. This, this is what translates later on in life into so-called concept of net worth and which is purely only money. It's not measured in character, it's not measured in, uh, in knowledge, in, learn, in, 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 in being learned. It does not measure in, in your output and contribution for the benefit of society. Right? I was uh, talking to a friend of mine and he was telling me about the school uh, which has children uh, who are given f food in the school. The school gives them a lunch box because without that, that child would get no food at all because the parents are druggies uh, and alcoholics. And, uh, and this is America, the richest country in the world. Um, children are, those, and the children in this freezing weather, they have no coats, they have no, they have no, and people are they're saying, can you please uh, send some money uh, for the children to have coats so that they they, have, they feel warm and they can they can go to work uh, and they can go to school, uh, you know, with uh, with proper clothing. Imagine how tragic that is, right? And then the children are fighting over toys. Now Christmas is coming today is uh, so-called Black Friday, and uh, there is shopping, shopping, shopping. This is the, these are the values that we are giving. I mean, imagine we are completely, this society is destroying itself. And like all societies which destroy themselves, they don't see it. They do not see it. So the best kids are those with the best toys. The, within quotes, best people are those who have highest net worth to help with their character, to help with their, uh, to, with their uh, compassion and kindness and, and learn and nothing, nothing matters except how much money do you have. This is, this is what Islam is directly against. Parents should do that. They insulate their children from poverty, from deprivation, from lack of resources, and thereby, and thereby they protect them from being exposed to the power of drive, of ambition, of single-minded focus on achieving big, ambitious, scary goals. They build walls between their children and the people who they must, in the end, deal with. People who will one day work in their organizations and decide their fate. People who need to be inspired and led and cared for and supported. And therefore, people who must be understood, not simply in order to do good and be charitable, but because the success of the business and, and the family depends on the development of these people, the great multitude. Fond parents ignore uh, or maybe they forget the fact that one day the time will come for the soft little uh, mollycoddled pussycat to enter the jungle of the real world without any of the tools it needs to survive, much less to lead others. And it is a painful thing to see. It is very, very painful. I, as I told you, I've seen that in, 
in at least two cases, if not more. And just as a, as a I won't say disinterested because I am interested, but uh, as an observer, to observe itself is so terribly painful. And imagine what it must be for that poor, by now, 40-year-old, no, no longer a kid. And to, to, to be, and when they look at their father, they look at their mother, there's this amazingly capable, competent person, and you ask yourself, what went wrong? And I know exactly what went wrong. And what went wrong was this overprotective urge. That is the biggest killer. It's like trying to grow a plant under the shadow of a huge oak tree. It will never grow. It will never grow. Or trying to raise uh, plants in a, or trees in a greenhouse and not exposing them to the atmosphere because then the first gust of wind will knock them flat. And this is very, very, uh, this, is, this is so critically important. Children must be supported, uh, not protected. They must be advised, but not told what to do. They must be allowed to make their own decisions. Uh, but, but without the benefit of the frame of reference of the, of the value, um, honor, fairness, responsibility, accountability, nurturing, leadership, if they are allowed to be, uh, to make decisions without the benefit of these things, then they will go definitely go wrong. And that is where the parents come in. The parents come in because you give them, you don't tell them what to do, but you give them the framework which they will use in order to make good decisions. Children must be allowed to feel, to cry in the night for the hardships that others undergo. Not their own, for others. To build friendships, to build friendships and relationships that span the boundaries of color, of race, of religion, of nationality, and much more difficult social order and prejudice. They must learn that to be poor and to be honorable are not mutually exclusive, just as to be rich and to be honorable are not the same thing and don't happen automatically. Rich people are not necessarily honorable. We have plenty of examples of that. Scoundrels come in suits. Children must learn that, that virtue is a state of mind, a stance, a decision, a position that one takes not because one, not because someone is watching, but because of one's own sense of identity. I don't do this because I am me. I don't do this because in our family we don't do these things. And this is all referring to honorable things. Sense of watching by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They must be, children must be taught the value of learning and to value those who provide it, teachers of all kinds, not only in schools. Children who are not taught to respect their elders or respect their teachers are deprived of the blessing of knowledge. Today this is a, this is a prevalent disease with many of the young and ignorant. They remain ignorant as a choice. To remain ignorant is a choice, a life-threatening choice. We need to learn to value knowledge and to go to those who provide it and to approach them with humility and with genuine interest and seek the knowledge and to value the knowledge. Today, if we even go to teachers with a critical attitude, we go to the teacher to judge the teacher. And so, thereby, you deprive yourself of the benefit of the teaching. I say to you, I do because of who I am. And I become because I do. I do because of who I am and I become because I do. It's a, it's a virtuous cycle. Children must know that our actions define us. They must learn that people will define them on the basis of both, what they owned and what they contributed. But they will honor them only for what they contributed, not what they owned. Because we are remembered not for what we had, but for what we gave. Only when they are taught to focus on contribution from their earliest childhood will they be able to fight the force of consumerism that is focused on consumption. Blind, self-centered con consumption that in the end will consume all of us. If we allow it to proliferate unchallenged. And if you don't agree, don't have children. 
seriously. That's far better than producing children who are a nuisance at best and a painful reality in the lives of others as long as they live. Next question that I was asked, whose responsibility is it to make a marriage happy? That sounds like a dumb question, isn't it? I mean, naturally, it's the responsibility of both people, both partners. Like in any agreement, it is important to recognize and accept this responsibility so that you will then do what it takes to fulfill it. As I mentioned above, and as I've been saying all this while, I advocate actually sitting down and having a dialogue before you get married about what each one is supposed to do and say. Talk about the responsibility. This is what I expect from myself. This is what I expect from you. Are we in agreement? Say it to each other and agree on it. And don't leave it to guesswork and discovery. That leads to misunderstanding and disappointment. And a good marriage is a dream. To make it come true, you must wake up and work. If you expect your wife to cook for your friends who you will bring home from time to time, say it. And also say what time to time means. If you expect your husband to pick up the food on the way home with his friends from the restaurant, say that. If you expect your wife to make breakfast for you and sit with you watching you get outside your egg and toast, say that. If you expect your husband to bring egg, egg, eggs and toast to you in bed, I mean, that's a quite a horrible thing. Uh, I'd much rather brush my teeth and go out and eat rather than eat in the bed. But anyway, uh, if you expect that to happen, say that. What I mean is that in marriage, it's often the so-called silly things that lead to trouble. So silly or not, say it if it is important for you. My brothers and sisters, um, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, uh, to give you beautiful marriages and to be pleased with you and uh, help you to live lives which are uh, beneficial for you to help you to live a married life that will be full of beauty and grace and harmony and peace and uh, which will be a source of great satisfaction for you, inshallah. And uh, may Allah give you children that you can be proud of and who will be, inshallah, a means of sadaqatul jariyah for you. وصلى الله على نبي الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين برحمتك يا رحمة الرحيمين وسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته